Welcome to Food Travel Talk TV, a monthly talk show brought to you by the World Food Travel Association, the world's leading authority on food and beverage tourism. Food Travel Talk TV was created by and for the world's culinary travel trade. Our goal with the show is to inspire us all with ways to help us do business better. Every month, we invite industry thought leaders, opinion makers, and trendsetters to discuss important topics for our industry's benefit. My name is Eric Wolf, and I'll be your host today for our July 2021 episode number 15. This month's topic is Food is a Force that Unites, Not Divides, Destination Marketing and New Consumer Expectations. And I'd like to introduce our guest, Mark Bibby Jackson, the founder of Travel Begins at 40. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me on your show. Feel free to post your questions at any time in the Q&A window. We will reserve the last 20 minutes or so to answer your questions. Now I'd like to set the tone for today's episode. Mark is the founder of TravelBeginsAt40.com. He is also an award-winning author and editorial director with more than 20 years in communications. Some of his more noteworthy achievements include establishing the first successful food, travel, and lifestyle magazine in Cambodia and winning the national award in Cambodia for the best self-published book and best Asian cuisine book at the Gourmand World Cookbook Awards in 2016. Mark's current project, Travel Begins at 40, is a website aimed at the independent mind, mature and empathetic traveler with the view that life and travel don't truly begin until 40 years old. The website features articles from travel writing experts who share their best and worst travel experiences with you to help nurture your next adventure. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Eric. So why 40? What happened in your life or career that that made this age the foundation for your, your current brand and project? Yeah, at 40, I was thinking about that. Um, at 40, I, I, I moved as an expat, really. I moved to Vietnam. So I, I worked as a VSO volunteer there for a couple of years, uh, teaching at the Institute for International Relations in Hanoi. So that was when I was 39. So 39, 40 was a big change for me. But the website, I was a bit older when I set up the, the website. So it's it's not just purely about my travel experiences or anything like that. It's not a personal blog, it's a travel website um and it was um it was when i was in the pool i was on a bloggers convention in Kathmandu, which if anybody has been to Kathmandu, they know how wonderful a place it was and i was surrounded by all these bloggers and listening to everybody's tales and i thought yeah why not set up a, a website for the 40 plus traveler and the idea is really to be specific for um, for that age group and the, the fact that when people travel when they get a bit older when they get in their 40s and 50s they they, they travel in a different way you, you you don't really want to have your backpack any longer you definitely want to have wheels on it rather than do your back in like I have and things like that you maybe want a little bit more luxury and you you probably want to take a bit more time over your travel you don't really want to rush it quite so much so certain things I think change when you get in your forties and fifties, and really that was the idea for the website to sort of to, to provide something for that market. Makes good sense. How long have you been doing this website for? I'll be giving away my age then. I think probably. you would be but, yes. Uh, no, I, I've been doing it for about three four years. Um, okay, I'm really bad on years, so I do apologize if I contradict myself. Um, that with years, and that's just because I get confused by years. <laughs> All right. Well, a look through your your um, your websites and your LinkedIn profile reveals a strong interest in Southeast Asia. What captivated your interest there? Yeah, well, I, I first traveled there when I was, well, I, actually in 92 was my first travel to Southeast Asia, but that's very brief. Then 94, I went the traditional British backpack, you know, travel around the world. In my case, it, it sort of got to Sydney and, and came back rather than going over the Pacific. But I was in uh, Southeast Asia for a few months there. And then I went back in, in well, I know, is it 2004? Could be the right year, might not be the right year. Um, and as a volunteer, as I mentioned before, uh, and and I, I stayed um, largely because of the people, a bit because of the food, uh, and a bit because it, it gave me a great opportunity to pursue what I always wanted to do, which was to write. Uh, I think one of the great opportunities you have for, for traveling and for being an expat is that you can actually pursue your dreams. You, you don't have to do what you feel you have to do when you're back in, in the UK or America or Europe, wherever you are. So um, it, it certainly does give you opportunities. And, and I, I, you know, I became a writer and I'd never been a writer before. Uh, I'd always worked in communications 
uh, so and I studied English at university, so I was always that way leaning. But uh, my first ever um, published article was in Hanoi, um, and that was a review of the um, of the of the film at uh, the cinema there, the um, run by an American guy. Okay, well, I, I want to talk more about your traveling, but I also want to talk more about your writing. And, and I know that you are an award winning author of two books, Peppered Justice and To Kill a Spider. What are these books about? To Cook a Spider. They're, they're both about, the, well, they're both detectives. I've got the two here so people can see. They to Cook a Spider, my, my mistake. I'm sorry. No, probably, that makes more no, sense. Probably, no. And uh, they're, both, uh, they're both set in Cambodia and they introduce a character called Inspector Satya, who's a bit like, uh, if people know Agatha Christie, he's a bit of a pro character set in Cambodia. And he goes around solving crimes. Uh, the first one is a lot more hybrid. Um, it's got a lot of cooking in it. So there's a constant cooking theme through the, through the first two novels. And the third novel, which is called Unraveling the Web, that should have been produced already, but because I can't get over to Cambodia at the moment, it hasn't yet been published. So I published, not produced. Uh, and and again, that's another detect that's another detective novel. But they all have food in it, and the first one in particular, they have recipes. So, for instance, you can into cook a spider. You have the recipe for how to cook a spider. So even if you don't like the novel, you can come away with a recipe. Um, and the second one also has a recipe. So I should really would it be with that picante sauce, or how do you prefer your spiders? Do you really want me to give a confession? I've never eaten a spider. I've, I've been filmed with it for publicity, but I've seen it. I've seen a lot of cooked spiders, but I haven't e eaten a, a cooked bug or spider or anything like that. But they deep fry it. Um, yeah. So you, you get it on the side. There's a place called Skun, I think it's called, and, and that's in, in central Cambodia. And that's the, the spider village. They also ca catch rats nearby as well. And I haven't eaten a rat, well, not knowingly anyway, uh, on my travels. And uh, yeah, deep fried. It's deep fried, uh, very crunchy. Uh, and it's supposed to have a lot of uh, protein in. And, and clearly, you know, in olden times, particularly Cambodian, uh, diet didn't have a lot of protein, so I think it was a very, it was a, a good source of, of of protein to to their diet. Uh, but I've never tried it myself. Yeah, I guess they're known for the fried tarantulas, and also is it fried scorpions? Do they have those there? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, bugs, more crickets, bugs, but scorpions, yeah, tarantulas, um, as I say, rats as well. I don't think they fry the rats, but, but but you really, it's sort of like, I mean, again, it's one of these things about cultures and what we're coming on to about cultures and food and stuff like that. You, you, you basically eat what you can get. And there's a there's a common link. So if, if you have a diet which is lacking, it's basically a rice diet. So Cambodian cuisine or diet was really very, very rice based. You're lacking certain things. So you add to it. And if what you've got locally is spiders and whatever, then you you, you cook them, you eat them. So that's how you supplement your food. It, it really depends what's available. It's yeah. very sensible. It's what you do. Well, I guess, you know, from from our cultural backgrounds we look at something like that and say you know ew gross but from their background it's it's commonplace you know they they do it and they they might think that we you know that we eat beef or we eat chicken or whatever it is they may or shrimp you know some people think shrimp that's disgusting how can you even look at that and yeah, Cambodian, Cambodians will eat all those but particularly if you go to Japan as well I've got a good Japanese friend who's taken me around um, not in, in Cam, not in Japan but in Bangkok to really really good Japanese restaurants and the Japanese eat everything you know they don't throw away anything so you know you'll have um, all the parts of the animals all the parts of the vegetables uh, will be consumed and we throw them away so for instance like uh, in Thailand um, uh, a good friend of mine it was a very good well, she, she knew, her brother was a very good chef and um, she taught me how to cook Thai food and, and then one of the things you really need to use is you use the root of the coriander which you clean obviously and you use the leaf of celery now in the UK I don't know it's like in other people's countries we throw away the leaves of the celery that, that's mm -hmm. you don't even think about eat, eat, eating that but it's great and it gives a lot of the flavor to Thai food and uh, so Various different cultures use everything. And I think in the West, we tend to be a little bit fussy and say, we're, going, we're not going to eat this. And then we eat sausages and stuff like that. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, what, what, what do you put in a sausage? I mean, 
you know, if, if you're happy to eat a sausage, you really should be happy to eat anything, really. The, well, this is true. And perhaps that's one reason why more and more people are becoming vegan and vegetarian, because we see we see these things and we're thinking, you know, but, well, is it animal ethics? Is it health and safety or whatever the reason is? I mean, I, I don't know. I it's that's one of those very difficult questions to, to answer. But um, so I, I've got to ask now. So so the title of this webinar starts off with food is a force that unites, not divides. So when you were traveling in Southeast Asia, what were some of those experiences that helped you to unite with the locals as opposed to being ostracized from them? Well, actually, the, the, the number one was, was drinking. Um, and, you know, when you drink rice wine, again, maybe some of your viewers will have had the same experience. And, and I was in a Cham for Cham session with, um, with Vietnamese. And Cham for Cham means 100%. So it's the equivalent of bottom sub, or you have to have to down the drink. And I was doing that like, the local rice wine. And I got enormous respect because I Cham for Cham with everybody, all the men. In, in this, it, was a, it was an engagement party. All the men were sitting around on the floor. And I Cham for Cham with the eight men. They chan for chan one with me. So I drank eight times as much and I was just, I was completely wrecked. I do not recommend it to anybody. Uh, I felt awful the following day, but I managed to walk out of the room and that gave me undying respect from the people. And the following day when they saw me, I only had to have one drink at lunchtime and that was disgusting. And, and but I, I, I developed that respect. And I think you do for, for food as well. It, it, you know, you sit down, you eat local food with local people, especially if you can speak a few words as well to make it sure that you're, you're really trying to be part of the culture. Uh, and and you, you just, you learn so much more. Uh, you learn so much about their culture, but you also learn so much about the, the shared culture. You know what I mean? In, in, in the UK, it always used to be the thing, the test of whether you were a good guy or not, is whether you stood your round. And that was always the test. So you went into a, a bar and you could tell the people, you, you, the good guys from the bad guys by, did they, did they buy their own drinks or did they just sponge drinks off you? So again, it's all this part of the culture. So what's the difference between us having to sit around and cham for cham and having to buy your drinks at the, your round of drinks at the bar? There, there's so many similarities if you look at it. And, and one of the problems I have with travel writing as a, as a profession um, is that, we, we, we look for the differences far too much. You know, the, the whole basis of travel writing really from ever has been the other. So you, it's the mystery of the Orient or whatever, that you, you look for the other, the differences between us and them um, in travel. And that's what people are supposed to really, really enjoy. And I think we should be also looking for the we. I mean, I'm not saying you, you, you ignore the fact there's some differences. Obviously there's some differences, but there's a lot in common. So I think there's a lot of the, a we in, in travel and, and and it should be. And I think food is a great way of, of finding that out. Mm. Well, it is, it is true. In tourism, we know that people travel for what's different as much as what is similar to, to us on our own. I mean, there's a reason why so many Americans love to go to the UK because it's, you know, the language. It's, you know, we came from the UK 200 years ago, 250 years ago. So we, we get your culture largely, right? And so that, I think, is, a, is an example of a connection. There's, you know, look at... Uh, French, former French colonies, they like to, to go back to France because it's, it's familiar with them. Um, Definitely, and, and it goes the other way around. And, and like for instance, in Vietnam, so much of the actual food thing is, is, is coming from, from the French. Some of the words like the, uh, the French bread, I apologize to all French people listening, is pan, and the, and the, and the Vietnamese is bang mi. So it's, it's, it's pan mi, you know, that's, that's the Vietnamese food bread. Um, the Vietnamese word for menu is menu. I mean, it's just because they, they inherited so much um, and they adapted the way that they, they ate, um, particularly, in, well, this is particularly in Hanoi, uh, mm -hmm. from the way that the French and the French, French influence. So it, go, it goes both ways, but, but definitely there's a lot of similarities between it, you know. And, and as you say, the British and the Americans are very, very similar, apart from in their sense of humor. This is true. Americans don't get humor. And <laughs> although I've always gotten British humor and, and never, I will, I, I was living in the UK for the past couple of years, but even before that, I was always much more aligned with British humor and you could have an American comedian on and the Americans in the room would be laughing their heads off and I'd be sitting there with a blank face. I just wouldn't understand why they would find it so funny, you know? <laughs> I'm afraid I'm the, I'm the same myself. I'm a, yeah. little, I'm a little bit of a snob on British humour, but, um, but 
but I think we do have a fine tradition in it. You do. Yeah. British definitely have a good sense of humor. Well, let's talk a little bit about slow food, uh, not slow food, slow travel. And mm -hmm. that is, I mean, everyone has heard of slow food, but what is really slow travel and what role would you say that food plays in slow travel? I, th I think it's two, two, two elements that it plays, but slow travel is basically is, is slow travel. It's about taking your time in a destination. So I was, I had a, an interview with uh, a good friend of mine, William Neymar, who, who runs Kiri Travel. And the standard in the China trip before COVID, obviously there's no trip at all, but before COVID is you basically did 21 days in, uh, you had 21 days or 14 days. You did as many countries as you could. You might even try to get China in there as well, but you know, you do Thailand, Cambodia, see Angkor Wat, go to Hanoi, Vietnam, go down some Kuti tunnels and try to bung as much as possible, four countries in, mm. in 14 days maybe. And, and that's, you, you, you get nothing, well, you don't get nothing out of it, or, um, you, you, but you get very little out of it because you, you, you're not going to understand the culture as, as well as if you spend a bit of time and and you, you're just you're going to be shattered as, as well to be perfectly honest but yeah. the, the slower you take the more you understand the more you try to experience eating the way that people eat but living the way they eat um the way they live the more you understand about it again in, in hanoi um, I was my first job and I was working there the, the boss took us all out for a dinner so that's the first thing the boss takes everybody out for a dinner you know and the women always end up paying the money it's a, it used to be like that it might have changed now so it's quite sexist um, the boss was paying but the women calculated the, the money and, and so what then happened was that we, we sat down for our meal and our meal was a fish it was one fish between about 12 of us. And it started off, we had the, the tasty bits at the beginning of the, of, uh, the tasty bits of the fish at the beginning. And we ended up always rice at the end of the meal with a broth and, uh, uh, and vegetables and, and fruit to, to, to right at the end. So you had all these layers, you know, in, in, in the courses. And I think from that, you really start to understand something about Vietnamese culture. You really oh. understand something about their life. Whereas if you, if you did the normal rushing through, you'd have a bowl of fur somewhere, which wouldn't taste like normal fur because it'd be, or it'd be served properly. You could see through it. If, if, if you can see through a fur, it's not a fur. It has to have lots of meat in the bottom of it. You know, it's a, it's a big meaty stocky thing. Um, and you would, um, and, and you'd, you'd have a, a you know a, a standardized westernized meal probably which you think wasn't westernized because you, you've got no idea because you're new to the country uh, and so you'd have all these false uh, local experiences rather than genuine local experiences you take more time instead of doing four countries you do one or maybe two in your 14 days and you get to understand the people better and I think as, as you know I said before I think the best way of doing that or good way of doing that is through the food. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think that when you just go and spend one or two days in a country, it's it's extremely superficial and you just don't get into the deep level of it. And I also think connecting with locals, if, if you can, if you have a business colleague or if you do a local food tour or something to help to get to know the local areas or even, even just talking to a waiter or waitress in a restaurant, you know, and trying to get to know the locals a little bit. It, every conversation that you have uncovers something else. It opens the doors to something else. You, you can, uh, we, we talk about food service ambassadors, right? Where it's that waiter or waitress who can talk about their favorite biking path or their favorite cafe or whatever it is. And um, I remember you were talking about Kathmandu. I was there a few years ago. We did our uh, food trucks Nepal event there. And it was one of those places I think that is on everyone's list to go to, right? And the name Kathmandu is just so exotic and, and Definitely exciting. Definitely go. Yeah. And um, wow, what a cool place. But it was, you know, there was, there was the Western people, a lot of expats there. And that experience was, was still very Western centric, even in Nepal. But then when I shifted gears to hang out with the Nepalese people, it was, it was completely different. And it, it was like, their values are different. Their jokes are different. And it was, it was um, really interesting to, to be in a, in a place that did have so many expats, but to experience it locally through the Nepalese, it was weird and good. Definitely. I mean, Nepal is one of my best examples for food because, um, 
Okay. I mean, I've, I've been tracking a couple of times. I'm fortunate. First time was in 94. So I'm, I'm really, really fortunate. I love Nepal. I, I can't recommend it more highly to people. But I love Dal Bart. I just, which is the standard street food, which everybody has. So you have veg, um, you have a dal, so you have dal lentil, you have a vegetable curry, uh, you have pickles, uh, you have rice, and it's non ending. You, know, you yeah. can keep on refilling it and refilling it and refilling it. And it's also very touristy because you have a lot of tourists will go to it. But you can have it locally. You can just keep on. And 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 I just always, every time I go there, first thing I eat is a dal bart. And I always say to everybody, I love dal bart. And then I always come back and give you more and give you more. And I'll eat more and more and more and more. And I love it. And so they have this saying in, in, dal, in Nepal, <clears throat> it's the dal, dal bart gives you power. So it's the, it's the thing which the trekkers, so the porters and the trekkers it's, it's, and the guys, it's what they eat to give themselves power. Mm. <clears throat> and then you get the Westerners who will go for pizza or something like that. And and pizza, and you can get pizza anywhere. I mean, why on earth would you want to get pizza in the yeah. poor? I've never understood that. So, <clears throat> so try the local food. Try it with the local people, as you say, and you just have a completely different experience. But you've got to allow, you, you, you've also got to be able to go out of your comfort zone a little bit. I mean, I've had snake wine in, in, on the street in, in Vietnam, and I don't think many people would be, be too happy in doing that. So Snake you, wine. Yeah, you, they, I, I don't want to describe it because it would, it would put people off, but, <clears throat> but you get that. It's basically from the blood of the snake. And, and it, so most people wouldn't want to do that. But, but <clears throat> if you're doing things like that, you really do get uh, a genuine experience of what life is like for the locals. And they open up more to you. You know, they will give you more of their experiences, their life. They will tell you about, you know, wh why they eat this way, how it started. And, and you'll get to know the people mm -hmm. far better than if you, if you just eat whatever's, you know, you go on some trip or tour and it, it's, you just eat the recommended food. Having said there's some excellent tour companies out there. Speaking of Nepal, and you were talking about people going there and, and looking for Western food. Are you familiar with Raj Gaiwali from Social Tours there? He also owns The Hub. No, sorry. No. Not. Okay. Well, we interviewed him on our podcast episode number 23, and he was talking about how you have all these hikers coming up Mount Everest and, and the other mountains, and the locals have now opened a uh, like Western takeaway food. You know, you can get pizza and spaghetti on the slopes of Mount Everest. And, and I, I mean, I just have to ask why. Why would an uh, a budding young Nepalese entrepreneur decide to open up a pizza joint on the slopes of Mount Everest? You know, why did you... That's what that's why the market is the market is yeah when i first went there in 94 and i went back about four years ago and the change in that time is just enormous and so the first time you literally did have to have dal bar i mean that's all you had so yeah you always huddled around in in the hut in um in the tea, what they call it, anyway yeah you used to huddle around in the hot the fire in the middle drying your clothes <laughs> getting mm -hmm. ready for the following day had your dal bar Next place, the same. We used to have Mars bars or Snicker bars or something like that. You could drink rum, I can remember that. So that was it, basically. But it, the food was local food. Um, and then it was only when you got down the mountain to Pokhara that you, you, you had your pizza. Uh, again, I'd have preferred to have the dal bar, but as a big group of people, we, we had a pizza. I can remember doing that. But now you can have pizza all half the up. You have spaghetti, whatever. That you have this massive menu of mm -hmm. of stuff you can have. You know, halfway up the mountain. Um, I, to me, I just it wasn't for me. I had dal bar every day, two days, twice a day. I had dal bar. Um, that's all I ever eat when I'm trekking. But do you think that's because the locals think that that's what the foreigners want? Because it, not just I'm, in Nepal, but in other countries, I've seen the same thing where they think you want it. So they give it to you. I, I'm so glad you asked that question. That's one of my pet bugs. When I was in Vietnam, I, I spoke a little bit of Vietnamese and I, I now try it out and people can tell me how bad my Vietnamese is. But I used to ask for black coffee. So I asked for Cafe de Nong, uh, Kong Zua. And that basically means I want to have a, a hot black coffee, if I got it right, without milk. Okay. So I emphasize without milk. And I'd always get served a white coffee with sugar, with the condensed milk in it. Because thing. you're a Westerner and that's what you I'm should a be drinking. 
Yeah. And, my, because, and probably because my, my Vietnamese was so bad. But I don't think they even realised I was speaking Vietnamese. They they looked at me, they thought, this is a Western guy. He's speaking some language I don't understand. Yeah, exactly. And and he wants to have a white coffee. So I served in the same as white coffee. Here's your, here's your Westerner's coffee, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure that's what happened. I don't blame him or them. I don't blame them at all. It happened to me on numerous occasions. Yeah. Um, and then when I was in, in uh, Thailand, or one of my recent trips to Thailand, I went to this... I can't remember the name of the resort, thankfully, because it was a horrible place where the local people didn't live. I mean, there was there was no local little resort. There was no local little cafe. I couldn't even find a local market. So it was nothing like anywhere else I'd been in in, in Thailand before. Um, and so I had to eat in, in a very nice looking restaurant, very comfortable, very pleasant, uh, very good service. And it was a perfectly edible fish I had, but it just wasn't. Thai really and all the other food it just wasn't Thai it was it was the Thai food that you're given that Thais give to tourists yeah. it's the food they expect that you want and I remember that next to me there was a table they were either French or German or, or something like that they were European uh, for sure and they they said oh can we have Thai food yeah 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 so I have this one and they said uh, but no spice we, we, we don't like spice well, the whole basis of Thai food, I'm not an expert, is you basically balance the, the heat against the sugar, you know, so it's not necessarily the most healthy, but you have a lot, lot of sugar and a lot of heat. And that's how you get the flavor, you get the depth of the, in the food. And so, you know, as I say, asking for Thai food without spice is a bit like asking for fish without chips. It's, yeah. you know, it can be very tasty, but it, it's just, it's just not the not same the experience. Thing, and, and I fully understand why they do that. And, and, but it happens back at home. I've been to Vietnamese and Thai restaurants back in the UK. I've been, I've asked for the dish. It's come completely different to what it should be served. I pointed this out to them and they've apologized. And they said, if we served it the way it's supposed to be, nobody would eat it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and 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 this is part of the problem. But you're right. It, it's it's because it's an expectation that this is what we like yeah. because that's what travelers have asked for uh, over a long period of time. Yeah, I think people. It's it's really driven more by money. They they heard this, so therefore they're going to do that. I was doing a um, a presentation to Malaysia about eighteen months ago. And one of the questions came up was, our food tends to be extremely spicy for foreigners. Should we dumb it down for foreigners? And we had a discussion about this. And the, the end decision was that there, for food like that, that may be either too pungent or too spicy or too salty or whatever it is, too something for another one's palate, that there, there could be a gateway cuisine, for example. So there's some innovation going on. And then what we decided on the case of Malaysia was that, yes, you could offer foreigners a, a less spicy version, but at the same time, let them know that this is not authentic, right? If you really want the authentic stuff, we'll give it to you. But, you know, here's the gateway cuisine. What do you think about that? Um, well, first of all, I think there's certain dishes in, in you can have in Malaysia which aren't at all spicy, you mm -hmm. know, so you can have the more, you know, they're, they're, they're not all. I love Malaysian food, Malay cuisine. I actually adore, I think Malaysia is actually the best country for, for food in Southeast Asia, personally. Thais will hate me for saying that, and Vietnamese will as well. But I like I Indonesia love, myself, which is very uh, okay. similar to Malaysia. You're yeah. a gado gado guy, but I, I just, I'm, I love, love Malay food, but, um, but yeah, yeah, I'd. I suppose, yes, it, there's an argument for it, as long as you also serve it properly as well. Mm -hmm. And for me particularly, you know, I I have to explain to people I like it the way the local way is. And and there's ways you can dim it down, you know. So like in Thailand, the reason why you, you serve vegetables on the side is if you bite into something a bit too, too hot, don't drink down a bottle of beer or water dig into the vegetables that cucumber or carrot or bean will, will take away the heat yeah. so it's things like that you know not all thai people love hot spicy food you know i mean my thai friends to be honest i, I prefer spicier food than them um and so when we when we go out for meals my good friend oh always has to say you yeah, know in thai she always explains to him no no he likes it the thai way honestly give it him give him the thai food but yeah i, I think you probably can you 
can have a you can have a star thing of saying you know do you want to have it the local way or do you want to have it for the for the tourists um yeah. there are some extremes to i mean i would if you ever go to lao and you want to have the the, the clam soup they have uh, it's so spicy i mean i just i don't mean there's hardly anybody in the world i think can actually could eat it outside so there are such extremes to heat as well but but i think yeah i think you should have it the local you should have it the local way and if you're not serving a local way yeah why not gateway food whatever you want to call it that, that makes sense to me um and and you know you, i suppose you get a little bit of the flavor of it that way um yeah. but um but yeah so um, let's bring it back around then to the other half of the title of, of today's show, which is Destination Marketing and New Consumer Expectations. Now, being behind your website now for three or four years, you've, you, some of your articles are really diverse. You, you're obviously you're, you're paying attention to what people are writing. You're accepting guest contributions. You're editing. You're, you're serving as the publisher. So what would you say the new consumer expectations are, especially perhaps now that, that you, we've had, well, 18 months going on two years of this COVID mess? What, what are those new consumer expectations that destination marketers can look forward to? Because I'm looking at the people in the room today. There are quite a few tourism office people here. And I think they'd probably like to know from a publisher like you, what's, what's changing? Okay, I, I thought you weren't going to mention the C word. I thought, Eric, you said beforehand. You You're right. To... I well, it okay. In. It slips in. It well, we don't. Okay, just forget. Forget I said that. How how are consumer expectations changing? <laughs> Okay, well, I, personally, I think there's going to be a, a, a split in the market. I think you're going to, when it comes back fully, um, and I think it's more advanced in America, the, the domestically tourism than it is in the UK, and, and the UK's got a bit of a mess at the moment. But I think it will come back in two ways. You're going to have those people who are going to go for the cheap holidays, we just want to have the cheap holidays. So they'll go for the cheapest flights, the cheapest hotels, the cheapest whatever. So I, I think that, that that market will still be there and it'll be very, very strong because a lot of people, that's all they can afford. And a lot of people, have, whereas some people have made money in COVID, a lot of people have lost all their savings. So they don't have any money to go on holiday. So they'll be looking for the cheapest offer. Mm -hmm. But I think, put that market to a side, and it's enormous, obviously. I think there's going to be another market. And I think the new luxury, the new thing, whatever people, it's not really new. You can call it sustainable. You can call it green. You can call it regenerative. You can call it whatever you want to call it. And it all is basic people want to have a more ethical basis to their tr travel. I think particularly in young consumers, you know, the 30, under 30s, I think they understand the climate issues far more than we do. You mm -hmm. mentioned about veganism um, before. Yeah, I think um, it's not just veganism. It's, it's about where you get, your, uh, how, how far the, the product travels. So eating locally produced food. So people want to know how, how far they're, you know, it could even be the potatoes you're eating or something like that. It doesn't have to. It can be perfectly vegan, but it could have traveled a long, long distance. So I think that's going to be very, very important. So people are going to want to offset their travel. People are going to want to think they're actually doing something useful with their travel. They want, they want to feel that they're, they're helping local communities. I think that's absolutely important. So I think they, they don't want to feel that they're just supporting some big hotel chain or some massive, yeah. great big um, you know, travel, um, global travel company, they want to be feeling that they can help local, local people. And so I've been studying with, uh, I've been, st I've been studying a diploma for people. I'm actually the, the oldest intern the world has ever known at the moment. So I'm on an internship at the SunX Malta um, program and doing a course on uh, climate friendly travel. And part of this is it's not just about the green element of travel, which is clearly there. And, and, I, and I, I really do encourage people to go for a sustainable uh, travel as they can. It's not just that. It's also about the clean part of travel. So we have to, you know, the cl climate change. Some of your viewers might think it doesn't exist, but I'm afraid you're wrong. Climate change has happening. We can see it all over the place. I'm sweating like mad in, in London. You, you just, you know, you're not in England, so I'm not in London, but you, we don't have temperature like this. You know, the, mm. the climate has changed. And in order for us to, in order to um, change this climate change, to, to 
bring the curve down. We've got to change the way that we do travel as a business. We've got to reduce our carbon emissions. We've got to identify them. We've got to reduce them. And of course, our big problem is, is the plane in the fact that there is, at the moment, there really is no alternative for certain destinations than to fly. And unfortunately, fly, um, you know, flight it hasn't been decarbonized and won't be decarbonized until 2035, even at the most optimistic uh, expectations to any extent. So, so we have got a problem on flying, but everything else, and I'm saying, so that's a big thing, but, you know, people can do their bit to try to reduce their carbon emissions uh, while they travel and they can offset uh, so we're doing articles on offsetting, and, and I know a lot of people got scepticism about um, about offsetting. Um, it is a greenwash for many people. It is a PR exercise. It's lots of companies. It's, it's handed over to their CSR, and they don't really care. They just want to make sure that they get media reporting to make them look like they're good guys. But for other people, offsetting is really, really proper. There's a gold standard which you can follow. So you, you can actually invest very small amounts of money to offset the carbon you produce and to support um, rewilding um, projects and reforestation projects, which are really, really, really essential for the future mm. of our planet. Indeed. You know, it's um, it's interesting to hear you say these things. There had already been a, a strong momentum, momentum towards responsible tourism. Yep. And there's, you know, responsible tourism network and all these organizations out there that handle that. And in fact, we recently signed a partnership with EcoStars based in Madrid, which certifies hotels, uh, their, their um, sustainability initiatives, but we're working with them to develop a food and beverage uh, sustainability assessment for um, hotels and restaurants and so on. But this this idea of responsible tourism is, is really the essence here. And I think that for us, sustainability is more passive. It's, it's something that, oh, I, I recycled that straw. You know, I get a gold star for that. But responsible is no, I'm actually, I'm going to Nepal and I realized while I'm there that they don't do recycling at all. So I am going to, of my own will, take all of the plastic waste that I generate and take it back with me to recycle at home, right? That is being responsible. I am having a zero net impact on the environment there. And and you're right, younger people, I mean, we're, we're seeing this all over the place. It's almost like they're reacting to all of the bad habits that their their parents and grandparents manifested. And they're like, no, this is BS. We, we need to, to get with the program. And they are getting with the program very quickly. Totally. I think you're completely right about the younger the younger generation. They understand that, um, unfortunately, you know, they understand that we have been making many, many mistakes. I, the only thing is, I think I think really the, the terminology can be confusing for people. So I think it's a bit like, you know, in Gulliver's Travels, which, which, side, which end of the egg do you crack open? I think it's, you know, so when you go to the sustainable, regenerative, responsible, you know, we got this climate friendly travel from the sun more to think, P people get confused, you know, it's basically doing the right thing that, that's what it's about and it, it you know you can call it build back build back better or whatever you know all these things you can come up with but it is about doing the right thing and and these are reducing the amount of uh, waste you, you you create um looking to um to, to to go with a company which is investing in the local community rather than sort of investing in its own shareholders um and trying to if you can travel by train or if you can avoid planes do if you can't you know you can't get a train to the maldives so if you want to go to the maldives you got to fly yeah. but then you can actually look to offsetting you know i mean there's a company i just had a, a chat with um uh, yesterday, Trees for Travel, they've got an offsetting program. There's loads of people got offsetting programs. I think the problem for the consumer is that they don't know which ones are genuine and which ones are just greenwash. And that, yeah. that is the major problem. So I think any, if you can, the initiative you just mentioned, if that can give authority and, and, and credibility to the uh, to, to to the green to green travel, yeah. Um, I think that is that is excellent. That that is what is needed to be done. Um, but ultimately, I think people go. You know, you go get a punt. You do your research. You think, okay, you know, this one sounds like it's a really good organisation. I think they're doing a good job. I'm going to offset my travel on them. And what you're talking about is very, very little amounts. I mean, they they basically, Trees for Travel have estimated that, that uh, one tree, to plant one tree is $3. That's it. 
So it's three dollars. So then you have to work out what your trip is as to how many trees you are for the trip. Um, but if you're going for a short flight, it's not going to be more than one, it's not going to be one, more than one tree. So for three dollars, which you know for most people is about a cu cup of coffee, that's what they say. But I I, I like to pay less than three dollars for a cup of coffee myself personally. But I'm just Spain. Uh, coffee's coffee's one fifty here. Exactly, exactly. You know, that's and I much prefer to have a, a shot standing up at the bar. So again, it's another thing we're talking about the culture where you do things. Yeah. You know, Spain and Italy, very shared um, and the way you drink coffee. And when I lived in, in Italy for four months, yeah, the first thing you had to do, you always on your way into work, you went in, stood at the bar, not back your espresso, and that was the way you could you had the power to go into work, you know. Indeed. So similarities, but also you know differences with other things. But but I, th I think fundamentally, do your research, try to work out which ones are doing it properly, which ones aren't, uh, and and make sure your behaviour is as good as you can do. I mean, I've been drinking because my voice is going all the time and it's very hot here. I've been drinking out of one of these, which I'm, I'm sure most of you will have something like it. So that reduces the amount of plastic. It reduces, hopefully, the amount of water being wasted. All these things. Just sure. do your bit. Uh, but the, the, I wrote a, an article on this subject just recently. I think the fundamental thing at the end of it is remember to enjoy your travel. You know, that's that's why you're going. Don't come out thinking, oh, no. You know, if, if the only way you can get a, a bot get some water is to buy, a, buy water in a plastic bottle. OK, just do it. And and and, you know, just accept occasionally, occasionally we were, we are going to have an unnecessary carbon footprint. Occasionally we are going to be on, uh, you know, we're not going to be so responsible in our travel. But make sure you enjoy your travel. But where you can make it as ethical as responsible as possible um i would like to suggest to people to go ahead and put your uh, comments and questions and thoughts in there uh for mark and i noticed that we have a couple people in the room who are involved in the luxury market so while people are thinking of their questions to ask you and writing them into the chat window um you know, you were talking about what people could do to be responsible and in the carbon offset and so on. Let's talk about the high end of the market. So that the people who are going to spend, you know, $10,000 or euros on a trip and they don't think anything of it, right? You know, yes, my family of four and I are coming over and, oh, you want 12,000 euros for that? Okay, let me wire it to you right now. Uh, what can a tour operator do, for example, to, to help do the right thing, but for an audience that maybe is not as used to having to worry about things like recycling and so on, what, what are your advice for those high-end type clients? Um, I would say you, you try to clean up your act as much as possible. I mean, there will be certain people who want to use a private jet. I think, I guess they'll want to always use a private jet if they're that, that, if they're that customer. I would suggest offset it you know, just put it in there. As I say, trees of travel, whoever else, you can offset the private jet. Now, it's not the best thing in the world, but if you offset it properly, that flight can help to reforest part of the Amazon jungle or wherever. Um, so it can be in the reforestry project. So you can do that. And if you if you put it to people as an option, then who's going to say, who, which, which person rich enough to fly by private jet is going to say, oh, no, I'm not prepared to pay $100 to plant a few trees in, in the Amazon, which is going to nullify my um, my uh, my carbon footprint. So I think you can do that. But I think also, I, I honestly do think that, you know, responsibility is the new luxury i think that's what people do people like want that. to yeah. i think people is it's not just responsibility it's about it's about getting closer to the community so that so let's put the offsetting to the side let's put the carbon footprint to the side but i think people get a far more rewarding experience by 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 getting to know the people who are hosting them and you know you, I, I think the days of i want to stay in a five-star resort with being pampered with massive all over the place and having servants serving me on whatever my breakfast on my balcony and stuff like that you know all that spoon feeding you themselves well, it was <laughs> no, I've, I've done it a few times fortunately i've never had to pay being a journalist uh, and it can be great yeah it can occasionally be great fantastic but it's it 
it's the same wherever you do it. It doesn't matter where you're doing in the world. The five-star pampering experience is exactly the same. But if you were to go into an eco-lodge in the middle of the Cambodian jungle, and you get to know the local people, or you, like I was you're stranded in Ecuador somewhere and you eat the local jungle food, and you get, again, you get to experience, you will come back with a far more enriching experience than the one where you... I mean, I went to a lovely resort. I went to a lovely place in central London and had a wonderful massage and had a wonderful spa experience. It's by the Air people, A I R E. Wonderful, just open in Covent Garden. I could have it anywhere in the world, basically. Well, I could have the same people in New York, they're in Spain. I could have had it in lots of different places, Copenhagen. But I could have similar products from similar organizations anywhere in the world. Um, but I can also get it in London. So, why do you have to fly to some island in the Caribbean in order to be pampered when I can get it just by taking a tube and popping into central London? I mean, you know, it's, 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 it, yes, OK, if that's what you really want to do, do it. But y you don't have to do it that way. I went to the Kamalaya Resort in Koh Samui um, a couple of times um, in the last decade. And, and there, it, it's, it, I suppose, it's, it's not really five star. It's a health resort and they, they monitor what you eat. They, you always have a lot to eat, but it's healthy food. You can do a you can do physical exercise program or you can do a detox program or whatever. There's loads of different programs as they do. At the end of it, and it's not um, it's not like going into a monastery and fasting for seven days. This is that's not the principle. There's a lot of food I can eat, and some people some people drink. I mean, it was a woman from America I met there, and she had, she finished a bottle of uh, gin on her balcony, you know, every evening before she came to join us for dinner. She was a great laugh. That's the um, way to do it: a bowl of gin before dinner. I love it. Well, I think uh, maybe not a bowl each dinner, but she certainly had had a fair share of it, uh, and she was great. We got on really really well. And um, but it but that both times that I've been there, I came I came back feeling so refreshed, so enlivened, so just felt wonderful. Particularly the first time, felt absolutely wonderful. My brain was fresh. I could write. I could work really really well. Um, you can have so many different experiences which you can provide to clients which are wonderful and they don't have to be the, they don't have to be the, the pampered five-star thing so i think local travel um make it make sure that it benefits the local communities people want to do this people want to learning new skills people want to learn skills you know on their holiday so you can get the skills into that and Okay, you can't reduce the carbon. Uh, you know, a private jet's going to be really, really bad for the environment. You can't, you can't mm. do that any other way. Offset it. It's not the mm. perfect way of doing it, but it's better to offset it than not to offset it. So, Mark, we've got a couple of questions here now, and I, again, I encourage anyone who has questions to pop them into the chat. There, the first one is: Would you uh, comment on the kind of impact that Anthony Bourdain may have had uh, on Southeast Asian audiences? Well, on Southeast Asia, people in Southeast Asia or, or people wanting to go to Southeast Asia? I, I think that the question is is more about, you know, he toured these countries, he did shows, he um, talked about the culinary cultures of these countries. What do you think the, the net impact of his presence there was on these these people? I don't, I, well, I don't... I don't I don't know. I mean, I think generally, I think generally in culinary shows, it goes the other way around. It's, 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 it, the impact is more upon the, uh, the people at home who are, who, are, who are logging into the programs. I've been involved in setting up one and I really, there's very little, there's very little interaction with the local people. Um, and I don't really know how much local people really watch the shows, to be perfectly honest. Um, so I think it's the other way around. And I think, I won't speak specifically about any 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 one um, any one a food writer and presenter, the and and travel writer, but there are people who do it properly and people who don't do it properly. I, I know there was one in Cambodia where a friend of mine was setting up the the food show. Unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the person who was the who was the the celebrity chef, um, because I might even mention his name. I can remember it was a guy, and I remember he was American. But he didn't even travel. He didn't even come over. He was on whatever you call it, the blue wall or whatever. So, so I was with the people. I helped um, put in contact with people to go to the local market to have these genuine um, uh, Cambodian experiences. And they were. They were done by 
you know, I suggested certain places. I conveyed in friends who did a did a fixing or whatever, and so it was all it was all relatively genuine. But the presenter wasn't even in the country. He'd never even been to Cambodia. Mm. Hmm. So we have another question here. Do you find that people are doing more research into their trips regarding cuisine sources and the cultural significance prior to taking their trip? I think I think people doing more research full stop. Yeah, I think particularly now because lots of people got time on their hands, and I and I think that's I think that's one of the pleasures which people have. I I I actually tend to be a bit bad on this one. I tend to like going there pretty blind and then sort of you know immersing myself in the experience once I get there. So I'm not a massive researcher in advance, but for a lot of people, half the joy is about is about working out beforehand and of course trip advice the social media all these ones you know there's so much information you you can get uh, out there um i would just sort of try to be a you know try to avoid the big guys because you know, i don't think you're going to get such a genuine um Actually, if you can go down to really local ones who you can find out they actually know the country a bit better yeah. rather than you know rather than trip advisor which i'd be very very wary of personally um yeah i think it's great i think if that's what you like doing if it gives you a great experience to understand more about the culture the one thing i would say is when you get there maybe you're going to be surprised and find out it's completely different to 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 what you read up yeah. uh, but again that can be a, a great experience um I went to, um, and, and it can be, I mean, I went to El Salvador and Honduras uh, a couple, in 2019. And there in El Salvador, there's beautiful pupusas. And I was making a pupusa very, very, very badly. I was in our small group. I was definitely the worst person at making a pupusa. And it's great. You, you find out about this. Now, now if I think... It makes sense to do research. So find out if you can if you can go onto you know a course to make pupusas. You know, yeah, take you half an hour to do. To be careful, else it's very very quick unless you're as incompetent as I am. Um, and you can really really enjoy the experience. So yeah, definitely do the research beforehand and enjoy your experience more. You know, in our association, we conduct food travel or research every so often. And in our latest study, we looked at all the different tools that people use and the use by food and beverage loving travelers of websites like TripAdvisor was not huge. And I think, you know, this just confirms what you were saying that for the mass traveler, they're going to go to TripAdvisor or, you know, Facebook, whatever, and, and look at, at, you know, what they think they should be looking at, right? And, oh, we're going to Nepal, so we're going to find out what to do on TripAdvisor. But the food lovers, we're explorers. So we're finding websites like yours. We're maybe going to Lonely Planet or Rough Guides or those types of resources or, or um, our favorite uh, food bloggers or travel bloggers and reading what they have to say because they, they might be living there, right, or have a different perspective and getting really different, deeper quality information. And that's really, those are some of the places where we're getting our information as food loving travelers. Yeah, I, I never I never use TripAdvisor apart from telephone numbers, to be honest, and website there addresses. There you go. It's pretty good for website addresses and telephone numbers, but um, <laughs> the, um, beyond that, no. And the part of the problem that I have is that I don't have, I haven't got the vaguest idea who are the people who are reviewing these places. I also have heard of stories which, you know, I'm not going to put them down because TripAdvisor might sue me, but I have heard of stories which makes me feel that not all the not all the reviews are necessarily 100% uh, accurate and reliable. So you, you always have that. But I have no idea. So honestly, frankly, an 18-year-old kid from some remote part of the, you know, <clears throat> the United States who's never been to a big city, his or, his or her <clears throat> view on the restaurant in Cambodia and mine are likely to be the same. And to be honest, I don't care what that person thinks about that restaurant because they're not, you know, they, they don't know. They, they haven't experienced as much as, as I have. They might love it. And of course, that's perfectly fine. Everybody has their own reaction. But but I'm, I'd much prefer to have the, the view of somebody who I can rely upon a little bit more than anonymous person from somewhere in the world. <clears throat> We have another question about Southeast Asia, since you are the resident expert on it. Uh, what are the specific fe features about Southeast Asia that may be of particular interest to younger food lovers? Okay, um, well, one of the things is the bubble tea and stuff like that. If you're into desserts, <clears throat> they, have, they, they, they love having these desserts. 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more of a Western dessert fan myself, um, but they often have things like tapioca and, and stuff in there. So it has mm. this, you know, unusual consistency. So I think I think that. So the bubble tea definitely the the, the, the desserts you can get, but it, it varies from from different place to, to to different place. And you know, you, Southeast Asia is totally varied. You know, as Eric says, he loves Indonesian food. I love Malay food. You know then it's completely different to what you get in the north of Vietnam. Vietnam yeah. has three different cuisines as the north, the middle and the south. And they're very, very different. So it's, it's really pretty hard to, 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 to go for that. What, what there is, is there are certain trends which are clearly there. So as I say, you know, you, you have a bit of the Korean influences coming in a lot in, in the country. So what I can see, in, in, particularly in the youth culture, as I say, the bubble tea. Um, and then you you get things like coffee. I mean, it's it's amazing how uh, Cambodia. The biggest change when I was there was the exposing in coffee shops. Uh, there's nothing at all uh, Cambodian about them, but so so popular. So, and, and this is part of the thing we haven't touched upon. It's about <clears throat> sometimes you think of culture as being what happened 150, 200, 300 years ago. Culture is what's happening now at the moment. And, and just because the way the food was and the, and the way the Cambodians or Vietnamese or whatever uh, ate food 100 years ago, this just means that's what they ate 100 years ago. Now they eat differently. Young Cambodians will have totally different tastes and totally different desires for what they want to eat to the older generation. Mm -hmm. the, the, the standard one in, in Cambodia is, is, is a, a thing called prahok, which is fermented fish. And it really does have a really massive stink. I mean, it really does smell and that can put people off. And this is the way tradition of Cambodians preserve the food. I would make a guess that that is so much more popular with older Cambodians than it is with a younger generation. I, I might be wrong. But, so you have a completely different, um, you know, you have a new new trends coming up, but, but definitely coffee shops. So I, I don't know why. Same in Thailand. It happens all over the place in Thailand yeah. and in, Cam in, in Vietnam. <clears throat> Explosion in coffee shops. It's been said that cuisines change on average every 80 years and the food that are grandparents great grandparents ate was not the same that people are eating today but you have to think about the globalization or the global influence of food so these coffee shops well where's that coming from you know it's kind of like a starbucks legacy and regardless of where you are in the world or in southeast asia it's the coffee bean and tea leaf right and and oh well they they're successful in singapore and hong kong so let's do them here in cambodia right uh and i guess you know you now you can get coffee of varying levels of excellence in most countries in the world but does that make it a cambodian culinary experience now or it's it's, it's well i mean it's a, an experience you can have in cambodia i mean in cambodia you really have cambodian khmer cuisine so you have the traditional khmer cuisine from the khmer people but then you have cambodian cuisine which is it's been influenced by the french it's been influenced by maybe by the thais by the vietnamese so you have different influences coming into the country so you you can sort of see a difference between the two um and, and of course, my good mate, Lou Meng, who I have to give a name check to, to Meng, who is the, the master chef in Cambodia. Uh, and he, he, he changed the cuisine because he made it into what he calls, a, I think he calls it a living Cambodian cuisine. And part of the reason for this was that his parents' generations and his grandparents, they didn't have fridges, they didn't have freezers, they didn't have food mixers. So the part of the reason why the food was the way it was is because they didn't have this. You know, if, if 300 years ago, Cambodians had had a deep freeze, they wouldn't have needed to, to ferment their fish, they could have just bunged it in the freeze and they could have had it fresh. So so where you are in your civilization and development and what, what machinery or techniques you have influences this. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I find about exciting when I'm traveling is the way that, again, young chefs and young foodies, and I think it's good you're saying about youth foodies, I think young people understand food far better than my generation does. Uh, you know, they really do. I mean, I, I, my hat's off completely to how you, you understand the differences between the, the different food and, and, and stuff. But what you're getting is you're getting people who, who are now taking spices from certain places and applying it to local ingredients so mm -hmm. such as my uh, there's a great restaurant if anybody's in in london uh, it, it, the best indian restaurant is the place called the grand trunk road uh, which is in south woodford where i used to was brought up I, 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 it brings out some sort of strange memories to me when i think about it but he applies they apply um traditional um 
uh, Indian spices, and they traveled all the way down the Grand Trunk, Trunk Road, basically from the borders of Afgan Afghanistan into Chennai in order to, to find these traditional spices. And they apply it to, to, to more westernized dishes, like you can have lobster, you can have scallops there, have things which you just would not have in India. So <clears throat> I think I, I'm very anti-fusion. I was never a big fan of fusion. I think we've gone beyond fusion. I think we've got it so that we can local dishes using spices from different places. So you mm. you localize. I don't know. Is there a term you know for it, Eric? Uh, you, you're localizing food. I don't know. You, you're doing it so you you're getting spices from around the world and and you adding it to your local ingredients and sometimes it works absolutely fantastically you and can, sometimes yeah. you're reinventing traditional dishes i was in a wonderful um, restaurant in berlin and i can't remember its name so i can't give them a name check but but they they'd reinvented a traditional um german dish which is basically just potato and apple and egg sounds very boring um and it's a and it's a typical german dish which fills you up great in winter i would imagine the way they did it was fantastic it was amazing it was just so it was so subtle it was so delicate and it was one of the best dishes i've ever had in my life and it just sounded so incredibly boring so i think you've got great chefs now who are doing wonderful work they've been they've been daring they've been original they've been experimental um and and i, I think they have moved away from fusion and they're just doing wonderful things with food yeah well, I've got, we need to wrap up soon. I've got one more quick okay. question for you. Uh, but before we ask that, I just want to make sure everybody knows that next month we'll be speaking with Curl Grant Hotch. Yalek, I can't say her last name, uh, from Pure Grenada. And she's going to be sharing her thoughts with us about regenerating tourism with food and drink, the case of Grenada. And next month's show will take place on Wednesday, August 18, at the usual 1600 London UK time. Registration will go live in a couple of days. Mark, where does Bibby come from? Oh, yeah, a simple one. Um, I was just about to say, at least I have an easy name to um, to pronounce. It's a family name. I mean, it's my full name is Mark James Bibby Jackson. So I've got I've got far too many names. Um, so it is, on my, it is on my birth certificate. It's not a nickname. Um, and uh, for, I hate it. I, I hated the name Bibby as a child. I used to get teased at school like mad about it. I'm a big guy, but I still was teased. And... Um, and but when I started writing, when I moved to uh, Vietnam, as I mentioned before, uh, there, there are so many Mark Jacksons in the world that you, you, you just don't appear. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, nobody ever hear, hear me. Um, but a good friend of mine suggested I start using the Bibby. And so I'm the only Mark Bibby Jackson in the world. So I can't hide. But at the same time, everybody can find out what I'm doing. Well, it's it's unique for sure, and I think it's it's great branding for yourself. Um, well, Mark, I am really excited to to have met you and to have listened to everything you had to say today. I know that you are now involved in a um, London Starts at Forty website project as well. I'm really excited to have a look at that. I love London; it's one of my favorite cities on the planet. So, hopefully, when I get back there next, I look forward to meeting you in person. Maybe we can have a, a coffee, one of those coffees. And, yeah, we can have. A, well, we can have Vietnamese coffee, of course. I mean, or we, we could have a bowl of gin. Yeah, or we can have to, gin is so so popular at the moment. That's another Indeed. about the trends. I don't think gin's really got into um, Southeast Asia yet, but I know the expats they've opened up lots of gin bars and stuff like that. So you do get that. Oh, and another trend, of course, is there's a lot of bio. There's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of green food being being produced, eco food in in Southeast Asia as well. So there's a lot more ethical uh, food in there. Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you again for your time today. Uh, really thank pleasure you. meeting meeting you. And thank you everyone else for attending. And we look forward to seeing you next month when we talk about Grenada. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your summers. Bye-bye.